good morning. Good morning, Monday morning, the, what is it, the 18th? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Karela. Hope you're well in Germany. Feels like ages since I've um, since I've been up here. Feels like forever. Good morning, Molly. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Right. So, here in the UK, it's Mental Health Week. And under normal circumstances, through work, there would have been a lot of promotion and things like that moving towards this day. Where, so, so from where we're at, and in this lockdown situation that's still very strict in Scotland at least, I decided to do some vlogs again on mental health awareness so beginning with A for anxiety good morning Lindsay so I just saw Ewan disappearing as I started my walk you must have kicked him out at 6 o'clock this morning morning Francis morning so mental health week I'm beginning with A for anxiety and what's my opinion so let me start by saying these are just my opinions it's a uh, it's the lens of which I look at things through. I'm not saying they're correct. I would always encourage you to do your own research and come up with your own conclusions. Um, so I'm sharing my thoughts, my opinions on anxiety. Now I very much look at the world through a lens of anything that's going on with us today has been formulated, encoded and conditioned into us from our childhood. Good morning, Gordon. <laughs> I'm laughing at Lindsay's comment there. Okay, so mental health, mental health awareness week. And I'm just being very clear that these are my opinions. I would ask you and always encourage you to do your own research and come up with your own conclusions. But I'm going to begin today with A for anxiety. And this is my understanding of anxiety. And I certainly look at the world through a lens that everything that we experience in our adult life has at some level flavours and tastes from past experiences. The most formative years of our life, our childhood, is where we learn the most and indeed embed and encode information at a very high rate. So A for anxiety. Everyone's heard of anxiety. Anxiety is big at the moment. And I do think that we have to ask those deeper questions about why 2020 has there been so many cases of anxiety predominantly amongst even our teenage peer groups. I mean, certainly when I was a wee kid back in the sort of 70s and 80s, I didn't know anyone that had anxiety. And a lot of people say that anxiety is just trendy. Anxiety, it's, it's, it's the buzzword. Um, it's, a, it's another way where adolescents get to gain um, attention by claiming that they're anxious. So I'm not going to go down that route, but childhood, okay. So, anxiety is, has its roots in childhood, okay? Anxiety certainly does have its roots in childhood because in childhood, it's what would be called as an attachment alarm. So what does children, what is children's biggest need as a child? Um, obviously apart from food, but I think if you were to study that a child could go longer without food than it can without love. Um, but again, I would encourage you to research that yourself. So, 
in childhood when you're a very small infant, anxiety would be felt, a scream would be delivered, and that scream would be an alarm for a caregiver to come and soothe us, okay? So anxiety was set up as part of our survival, which would have been adaptive. It would have been an adaptive response. Anxiety would have been set up for us to scream because the child's need, the most fundamental need of any child is attachment. If you're interested in that, there's uh, oh, many authors. Bowlby, obviously, B-O-B, Bowlby. Or B O B L Y Bulby, or Klein, Melanie Klein, and there's loads of beautiful authors on the attachment theory. Now, what if you were a child and your parents had been taught not to pick up a child when the child cried? Okay, so now that anxiety that you're feeling that's Primitive is an anxiety, it's an attachment alarm, it's where you need to feel attachment, you, you're feeling not safe, you're not feeling bonded or connected. You let out a cry, the caregiver comes and soothes the child's needs. Okay? So, what happens if you've got a parent who wasn't present, who was taught by physicians? at the time that it was unhealthy to pick up a child that was crying. Okay, that was the case. But also, what if you as a child had a parent that had drug or alcohol or substance misuse issues and that wasn't present and was not able to meet your need? What if you had a parent that's sitting on their iPhone? Now you might be, you know, I've seen parents Feeding, breastfeeding in public parks, sitting on their phone. Now, out of all the senses that are being evoked, the touch, the love, the nourishment, there's one that's missing because the mother can't be in two places at the one time. And where their attention is on the mobile phone, the attention's not on the suckling baby. So what starts to happen there in the child is that anxiety then starts to become generalised and it shows up in our adult lives. Why? Because we're wondering if you've ever been looking out and there is no imminent danger, but you're feeling anxious. There's no threat response. There's no danger, but you're feeling these levels of anxiety. I would encourage you at that moment to press pause and go inside and ask, what is this really about? Now, Um, anxiety um, we've all heard the perception and how we perceive things but there are many perceptions um, perception neuroception an innate perception the human body is far more intelligent than I think anybody on this planet fully understands and we are social creatures and unfortunately we're moving towards a very cold and sterile world which is the world of the internet which is the world of technology now one of our primary needs is to feel met seen and experienced through the eyes of another person and we just don't get that through technology. It's just not there. I have a belief that we're all craving attachment. And if we just look at the amount of people that are working in their lives through a smartphone, we're attaching to that. We're attaching to that technology. Is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? It's certainly more unhealthy if you don't know you're doing it. So back on the anxiety. How do we combat that anxiety? Well, the first thing 
is to recognise it, um, to to uh, steal the words of Dr. Dan Segal, name it to tame it. The minute we name something, which is fundamentally step one of the 12 step process really, name it to tame it. You see what happens is anxiety comes across and it may be through our neuroception, we may not it may be something that's out with our regular field of perception that we're picking up on. Because we're taking many cues from our environment. Some of those cues are verbal and a lot of those cues are non-verbal, how we uh, interpret facial expression. But when you're in a place of anxiety, even a facial expression, a kind, warm facial expression, is difficult to soothe our um, overactive limbic brain because we're not perceiving it effectively, we're perceiving it as a threat. So anxiety is starting to name it. And what starts to happen when anxiety starts to come is we start to become fixated, we start to ruminate, we start to what is and what's happening and what, what's this about and what does that mean? And then what we do is we tend to go because smartphones is our Smartphones is our modern day drug for numbing out, which used to be the TV or alcohol or tranquilizers. So, when the anxiety comes on, we tend to go on the internet. And because of where our mindset is at, and I do question what if there was a coding of algorithm that was able to detect what way your mindset was going by simply the way that you were posting on social media, and then those algorithms started delivering advertisements to you that were in alignment with your mental state. Now, wouldn't that be far out thinking? But people who are anxious seem to start to go because they ruminate and they're asking these questions, which seems to dig them into a hole. And they start reading about conspiracy theories or that life's a, life's a computer game and nothing's actually real and all these kind of things. Now, does that soothe their anxiety or does that just exacerbate our anxiety well of course it does now if you're still looking externally at these conspiracy theories or you're reading about depression and you're reading about anxiety and then oh I've got that and I've got that and then you hit another link and then before you know it you're on another link before you know it you're diagnosing yourself with schizophrenia or borderline personality disorder that's because your intention is still on the anxiety my suggestion is to take your intention off of the anxiety and bring yourself into some somatic type experiences, some somatic driven bodily type sensations, things that are within your control, okay? Now, people will say, oh, this sounds too simple, but if you've never had anxiety, yeah, I have had anxiety. I have experienced anxiety. I'm sure I'll experience it again. And what I do know is that more that I look at it, the more that I recognise the anxiety, the more withdrawn I become, the more I disappear, the more my energy and intention goes on anxiety, the more the anxiety increases. Okay, so the trick is, is to pull your metal-like intention off of a very powerful magnet and move it over onto something else. So as you start to move your anxiety over, onto some somatic type feelings. What's going on in the body? How can I bring it back to my breath? Put a hand on my body, put, the one I really like, is if I'm ever feeling anxious, is put both hands on my lap, put both my hands on my lap, and I just feel my hands, and I just really focus on my hands, and then I start to ask myself, what hand's warmer? I've always got one hand that's warmer than the other. And then I start to go into that. And then I start to laser my focus completely into the feelings and sensations in my hands and in my body, bringing it back to my breath, breathing. Now, if you notice when you're anxiety and you notice how you're breathing, you're breathing into your chest, you're breathing very, very fast. Right? Now, chew chewing gum. You know, eat 
because that would be counterintuitive because if there was a real threat that would be creating real anxiety, the last thing you would be doing would be sitting down and having a three course meal. Chew chewing gum. Bring your breath deep into your diaphragm. Change how you're breathing. Now, a lot of people haven't really been taught these things and they believe that they're powerless to the anxiety when if you do put the hard work, it's not easy, you put the hard work in to managing your anxiety in a more effective way than using drugs, alcohol or numbing out behaviours, then you can bring it back into some kind of alignment. So, A for anxiety, this morning is kicking off the beginning of Mental Health Week. Anxiety is not something that one should feel shameful about. Anxiety is certainly something that's a global, a global phenomenon right now. And in a world that actually encourages separation and distance and is um, selling more devices that can get you online quicker and faster, they're certainly moving away from a world which is our innate way of being, which is social creatures. And we're moving more into separation and un undoubtedly what you're going to be experiencing there is anxiety. We're not only in mental health week, we're also in the midst of what's been a pandemic of COVID-19. And they're actually encouraging social distancing, encouraging us to stay away from one another, encouraging, encouraging us not to have human contact and touch, which is actually our basic fundamental human need in order to be effective human beings in this world we need to be held we need to be met we need to be touched and that takes us back to our early childhood which is where attachment theory forms and hmm, looks like a tree's fell down on my path here god um so Look at your childhood. Look at these places where attachment perhaps wasn't formed effectively because we may have had a parent that was suffering from mental illness herself or through using drugs or alcohol or even sitting on a mobile phone or indeed slightly older that they were actually told by a physician that it was unhealthy to pick up a child when the child cried. The crying of a child is what's called an attachment alarm. The child feels anxiety, the anxiety promotes a scream, the scream calls and beckons the parent, the parent comes and soothes the child. But ask these deeper questions, what if you were a child that had a parent that was stoned, drunk, on their mobile phone while breastfeeding? A child needs us and requires us to be as present as we can be with them in order for the attachment to occur, and it's, there's so much more, there's so much more goes on in there. Um, the ventricle vagal nerve, is it starting to form? The formation of the prefrontal cortex. All of these limbic and brain structures are all formed by the, 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 the more available that one can be when one is parenting a, a child. Now, how do you cope with it? Name it to tame it. Go into the feeling. And don't let the feeling control you. Do your best to put the brakes on that. Because it's very, very easy for anxiety to take over your world. And for you to start to come disabled by it. Um, please stop reading conspiracy theories. Please stop giving your intention to things that really doesn't warrant it. Now... It's all very well looking at these kind of stuff, but I think you have to have a very, very um, solid foundation or grounding in who you are uh, to be able to discern between what you want to accept within that and what you do not want to accept in that. If you are uh, vulnerable to these kind of things, everything you read, you believe. And in actual fact, it's not all true. I'm not saying that there isn't components of it that's true. But a lot of the people that I'm speaking to just now around about their anxiety is being fed 
by reading very deep and elaborate conspiracy theories because they seem to be everywhere right now. And I would encourage you not to read them at the moment. That's not to say you never read them again. Wait until you've got both your feet very, very well and planted on the ground before you start that kind of stuff. And certainly, please do not pay any attention to people that call themselves mental health practitioners, coaches, or have your best interest at heart when they're feeding you with the kind of information that is anxiety promoting rather than anxiety curbing. Um, you have the power, you can control it. Um, there are techniques, but it takes hard work and it takes effort. Most of us find it very difficult to actually put in the hard work and the effort that it takes in order to manage our anxiety. So A for anxiety, um, that's today. Tomorrow I'm either going to do something burnout, borderline, something beginning with B, and we'll work our way through the week looking at certain types of mental health issues that are dominant in today's society. And really, I would encourage you to ask deeper questions. Why? Why right now do we have a pandemic of anxiety? Why have we got children on antidepressant medication? Why do we have children on anti-anxiety medication? Why? What is societally going on that's causing these ills in our community? And what can we do um, to assist? What can we do to um, manage? And I think being mindful that if we're in a good mood, people that we're meeting might not be. And, you know, this, the way that we phrase things, and it's not that we need to be on eggshells around these people, but on the same token, we have to be empathetic to how they might be hearing or interpreting how we are speaking because of where they're at in their limbic system, because of where they're at in their brain. So if we've got a child or an adolescent that's feeling anxiety, they might be very snappy or short. That's well, just adolescence. But ask what is it that's deeper because in a lot of ways what they're doing is pushing away when really what they want is to come closer. But in order for them to, to come closer, they have to break that fracture of where the attachment would never maybe have been met earlier on. And what became an adaptive response is now became maladaptive. So have a fantastic day. I am... Um, have an absolutely fantastic day. I am definitely running late. And... Um, uh, yeah, have a fantastic day. All the best. Wishing you well.